Hi, my name is Slinky. Thank you for listening to To My Mom. I never listen. Carolyn, thank you. I can't believe I finally get a chance to have some one-on-one -on -one time with you. We're both usually going in opposite directions because of what we do. We do a similar job. So thank you so much for joining us on Nothing But Net. Thanks for having me, Deb. It's great to be with you. So I want to tell you about something that um, you were the inspiration for, for me. Um, with it being Black History Month, every February it rolls around. It's also the Play for K month, you know, so I think it's really interesting that the two of those events coincide just because of who Kay Yao was and, and what she meant to our game and the young women that got a chance to play for her. But uh, I, I digress on that. Um, you uh, helped me see the need to be able to tell stories of the first women across the ACC, the first black women that got a chance to play basketball in the athletic, uh, the uh, ACC. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to ask you where the genesis came from for you, because you sort of put it out to all of us like, hey, what are you guys doing to celebrate Black History Month? And it was a collective you. And it really made me think, what am I doing? So I decided that I wanted to have a podcast. Thank you for joining me. Well, I had Debbie, um, I'm an advisor to the Advancement of Blacks in Sports. It's a group of African-American coaches from all different aspects of coaching, from men's basketball, women's basketball, football. I mean, it, 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 it expands the gamut. They challenged each one of their coaches that are a part of this on their campuses to, in the month of February, to celebrate uh, a historical hidden figure. And so when I looked at that, I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to take a piece of that. And I want to educate and celebrate the first African-American women that have played basketball on the campuses of the schools that I cover. Well, I go to the, my computer and I go to the Google. And as I try to find out who these women are, there's not a whole lot of information. When you put in who was the first African-American woman to play at any such school, you start pulling up, you get a lot of men and everything that they have done, but there's very little about the women. So this year, um, Asia Wilson, there was a statue erected in Columbia, South Carolina, and her mother tweeted in the month of February, this isn't Black History Month for her, it is Black Her Story Month. And I stole that, her story. So in looking at that and what the WNBA did this summer was say her name, I said, why not? Let's celebrate the history of black women and the contributions that they have made to women's college basketball. And let's dig a little deeper. Let's do a little research about the first to have played this game of African-American women, because we weren't always, <laughs> we weren't always allowed to do that. And now that we are, that's why we springboarded to the greats that we have now today. I love it, Carolyn, because what you have done for me is I have been introduced to some new friends that are representative of some women that played basketball before me at the ACC schools. And um, I mean, these women made it possible for me to play as well. I'm not a black woman, but still they paved the way because any woman who can show the courage and the strength to play and do it at a high level helps all of us. You know, it's like people that do their job well that come before us help us to be able to do our jobs well also. Um, I'm on the Collegiate Coaching Diversity Pledge Advisory Board, and that group is to help make sure uh, that athletic directors sign a pledge stating that they will make sure they have diversity inclusion in their hiring practices in football, men's and women's basketball. and I agreed to do it because I was like, I'm already doing this. Like, I, I didn't think it was anything new for me in trying to help young women or help put people in jobs that um, want to be head coaches. So 
I thought it was really great, but what this does is it's kind of a level of accountability. It has no teeth behind it from a disciplinary standpoint, but what it does is from a, from a public court of opinion, it makes sure that schools are not just checking a box, but that they are literally interviewing people with diverse and inclusive backgrounds. And I think it's really important. And it seems like we shouldn't even be having this kind of conversation right now, but, but we continue to have it, right? Oh, yeah. We, we have to continue to. It's not a conversation that you have for a little while when it's a hot topic and then it goes away. You know, back in 1993, I was the first African-American coach that Pat Summit ever hired as an assistant. And I was uh, became a member of the Black Coaches Association. And there was a meeting in Orlando, Florida. And when I walked into the hotel lobby, there was a table of legends and I was summoned to come over. At that table sat Vivian Stringer, John Chaney, George Ravlin, uh, Marianna Freeman, Marion Washington. Um, I mean, it was the greats that I have all looked up to. All Hall of Famers. All Hall of Famers. And when I went, walked over to the table, and it was C. Vivian Stringer said, you know, you've made history. And I'm like, what? And she said, you're the first African-American woman that Pat Summit has ever hired. I had no idea. And wow. he said to me, you have a great responsibility to, to do the best job that you can. And I, and I remember that. And I, I sat at that table and everything they said, I was trying to be a sponge. And every um, tutoring session or uh, breakout session that was had, I was taking every note that I could in, in feeling the accountability yes. of that opportunity that, and I was a restricted earnings coach. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't a full-time assistant. I was making $16,000 and I was in a closet with the four decks of the, the, the VCR, uh, stack, the VCR stacked up. Oh, yeah. I was pushing play, record at the same time and, you know, trying to make it happen. But I thought about that. And I think about that to this day of uh, that conversation with and to be around such legends that were in the process. They were sitting in that table trying to figure out ways to break through glass ceilings that they were continuing to provide opportunities for other African-American men and women to break through in the business to have coaching opportunities. But Debbie, like you talked about, you have, with the ACC, you have gone out to uh, research and find the first African-American women that have played. And when I did that in the SEC, and I look at some of them didn't start playing until 76, 78. I was 11, 12 years old. And at that time, I was in a sheltered environment in my mind that it, there was there was no – why would not – I would not be able to go to college and play basketball. Like, that's what my parents instilled in me, that if you want to play basketball and learn, this is an opportunity for you. For them, when they were my age, that wasn't an opportunity. It was not even a possibility. And for them to have that opportunity, and some of them in it, the, the SEC said, I didn't even realize what it meant because they didn't know any different. Mm -hmm. They were recruited because they were athletic, because of what they could bring to the benefit of the team and understanding the barriers that they were breaking. Didn't really understand it at the time. They were just playing a sport. But you know what? They were damn good at it. And that opened up the opportunity for the rest of us to follow, to be able to have, to play and do the things we do now. Carolyn, do you believe that if we don't understand and learn about our history, we're damned to repeat the mistakes that we've made in the past? Isn't that one of the messages? I mean, I feel strongly about it for today's athlete. How do you feel about it as a black woman with all the black female athletes that we have on college campuses across the country? 
Well, I don't know that we're damned to repeat the same mistakes in the past because you can't afford to have a quality product on the floor without us. And that's just honest. But what I do believe is that you have um, an accountability when you look at what the past and the sacrifices that were made, the, the uh, obstacles that had to be overcome. When I hear black women that were the first that go into a restaurant and they are not served and they were, they continue to be, to be a member of that team and to continue to compete with that group of teammates that were treated differently from them. There's an appreciation that I have of those black women that went through that and continue to persevere. So when you understand history, it's more of a appreciation for where you are. It's a celebration. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a fear. I don't even have an anger for what happened in the past. I feel, a, I have a feeling of triumph and I have a feeling of, of optimism of things moving forward. I look to the future with an appreciation of how hard it was in the past. I'm not saying don't don't forget the past. That was hard. Right. That was painful. But those women for what they went through allow the opportunity for what the young women are able to experience the opportunities that they have today. I've known you for a long time and just recently, maybe it was me not paying attention or maybe it was you consciously making this decision to do this, but you have been talking more about being the first black woman to win a national championship and Dawn winning the second than I've ever heard you talk about it recently. I mean, recently, like in the last couple of years. Why did you decide to use your voice to talk about your own, you're not, I know how humble you are. So I know you're not being braggadocious and, you know, trying to pump, pump yourself up. I know what you're doing. I think I know what you're doing. Tell me what you're doing by tell every, telling everyone that. You know, growing up, my mom always taught my brothers and I a great deal of humility. You just, you do what you do. You accomplish what you may accomplish and let somebody else talk about it. But, and even to the point of when I won the, our team, because I didn't win it by myself, but our team won the national championship in 1999. And the reporter came up to me and said to me, Carolyn, how does it feel to be the first African-American woman to win a national championship? I hadn't thought about it. I had my nose to the grind and I was just trying to win ball games. Um, understand this, my grandfather, um, was a product of an unfortunate, uh, an um, unfortunate situation. I'll just leave it at that. But he was a very proud man. He is, he was half black, half white. And, but he was very proud of being half black. And he always said to me, Carolyn, you're never discriminated against unless you choose to be. And so I never would allow that names being called or people trying to treat me different. It didn't matter because I knew who I was and what the potential of what I could accomplish was. So after we won the national championship, again, just continuing on, just trying to be, because he always said, you have to be 150% better than the next person because you're going to only be judged on what you are above 100%. So now in today's climate and the more recent of talking about how important it is to be what you can see, it is important to me for young women, uh, well, really men and women, boys and girls, to have the respect for African-American women to see what they can accomplish. It's not a matter of, of discarding the humility, but it's also the response. I just really feel like get rid of the secret. <laughs> it's not a secret anymore. 
If given the opportunity, we can accomplish some things. And so in winning the national championship, if I am able to inspire the next African-American woman, the next African-American father of a daughter to encourage her, this is what you can do. That is important to me. When I gave Don Staley that piece of a net, which I thought was a secret until she told the world after they won the national championship, it was because I saw in her what I felt like could be done to carry on the evolution. She cared about her players. She was a strategic coach. She knew the game, loved the game, and loved the people around her. That's the recipe. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 not com it's not complicated. It's not a secret. And it's not a secret. <laughs> and so, um, you know, as, as we go through society and what is happening today, it's not a matter of pro-black, anti-white. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. If I see another coach that I look at that, hasn't won a national championship before and shows the, the potential that they can win it and they are doing things and things that I believe in to be able to accomplish it, accomplish it. I'll share another piece of the, the net. I don't discriminate. You know, it is, um, it's just about give each an equal chance. You know, there's too many times where there were too many times leading up to where an African-American woman wasn't given the opportunity to put, get in a position of a winning program, a program where they could win. It was more of an African-American woman had to take a job to be a head coach because it was available. You know, when I got to be the head coach at Purdue University, it was because Nell Fortner was going on to coach the United States Olympic team. And it wasn't because necessarily that Purdue University um, put me through an interview process because I didn't interview. They hired me because they had already, they had fired Lynn Dunn, they had hired Nell Fortner. I was going to be the third coach. I think it was a matter of convenience. But because of the matter of convenience, I had prepared and we were able to be successful. So the preparation doesn't have anything to do with the color of your skin. Right. The preparation has to do with the person's preparation for that time. So don't discriminate and keep those people because of the color of their skin out. Look at the preparation. And that will allow them the opportunity to be successful. When I look at Don Staley, and I kudos to the athletic director at the University of South Carolina. Because she turned him down the first time and said, I got a job. I'm at Dimple. I'm doing well. He came back and rode with her through the neighborhood in Philadelphia of where she was from to get to know her. And once he saw that, he was like, I got to have her because of what she's about. Because, and because of that and the research that he did, he has reaped the benefits. The university, he's gone now, but he reaped the benefits. Yeah. South Carolina reaped the benefits of a Don Staley. Eric Hyman. I mean, look. Yo, how Eric. many, we can talk about this. Athletic directors that fire women's basketball coaches and have no idea who they're going to hire. And you know what they hire? Who wins the interview or who might win the press conference? Not necessarily who can provide and build a winning program at their university. I think every athletic director has in their back pocket two or three football coaches or men's basketball coaches that they are going to consider should something happen or change. And I don't think enough of them put enough thought into, but that's why they have us, Carolyn. You and I can help them with that. That's part of what we do. I mean, they hire the search firms. And the search firms can do some things, but intimately knowing the game for as long as we've been in it, that's what I feel like is a part of my responsibility. No one's asked me to do it. Nobody pays me for it. I don't, you know, it, it's what we do. It's trying to help make sure our game continues to move forward. 
that's what's important to me. But I have, I've done, um, I did a call this summer, a Zoom, because we were all doing so Zooms over this summer with Gino and Muffet McGraw. And the question was asked, how many ADs with the openings that happened all this summer, how many ADs called you? Gino said there were plenty. Mm -hmm. Muffet McGraw said two. Now he called me one. That's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, especially I'm behind the curtain of every program in the country. You are too. Yes, we are behind every curtain of every program in the country. We see all head coaches and assistant coaches, what they do, how they deal with players, what is their strategy? What is their preparation? How good of recruiters they are? I'm on the road in the summer, most of the time visiting with friends of mine on the road as they're recruiting, if it hadn't been COVID and watching high school players. Right. And see who's in the gym, who's taking notes, what's their evaluation process. I'm evaluating players as it is. I got one call this mm -hmm. summer. So it's more of, and you know who you call? You call who you know, who you're comfortable with. Yep. You might, we might need to expand. This is a thing with society. Right now, let's reach out and talk to people we don't know. Because you know what? You might learn something. That's right, that uncomfortable conversation because you need to be curious. Absolutely. There's, there's two cliches that... I, I don't like one is uh, or that I that I think are interesting I shouldn't say I don't like them I, I don't I don't prefer them but um, judge a book by its cover right how many of us do that or walk a mile in somebody's shoes like you don't know until you've actually spent time trying to figure it out learned ask questions have those difficult conversations it's important how about Borrow a pair of my glasses. That sounds like something your grandmother said. <laughs> and you know it. <laughs> Carolyn, let's shift gears for a second because we are behind the curtain all the time. And in and, and typical years, you and I aren't even have, able to have this conversation because we're on the road traveling, we're on the plane, we can't get together for a podcast. We can't do any of that, right? This is what's unique about this year and great that I, I've been able to put this podcast together because I can have these conversations. You and I might have had this conversation on a phone, but we get to do it here and share it with everyone else. So uh, let's shift to, in particular, like the SEC, because I know you cover that a lot, and that's uh, a big part of your schedule. And, you know, there's a lot of good teams in the SEC. Let's just kind of break it down. Like, as we move into the mid part of February, and we got a couple of weeks left uh, before we get into conference tournament and, and postseason. What's your assessment about where the SEC is right now on the, on the big stage? The SEC tournament is going to be the best mystery you can tune into. Because I think it can be anybody's game. South Carolina is a great team. It is, it's a very talented team. But I think what is uh, still to be developed is the leadership. Losing your senior point guard in Ty Harris and relying on Destiny Henderson, it got exposed in their game against Connecticut. And I think they picked on her. They went at her, tried to speed her up. Um, can she bounce back and really understand um, the leadership and the calmness that she's got to play with at that point guard position? Texas A&M, they hit a little, little stop, little stutter there. Um, and they've got to have a post game that is consistent. It's not always there. Doesn't happen. Arkansas, rebounding is a big question. Because in games that they're losing, when they lose, they're, lose, they're losing the rebounding battle of an average of about 14 rebounds a game. Kentucky, um, 
Kyra Elsie has done, I think, a phenomenal job with her first year as a head coach and adjusting to not having Matthew Mitchell, the program is used to, um, and that Ryan Howard is used to. They have much more talent around Ryan Howard. Now finding that blend of a superstar All-American with the rest of that talent has got to come together. Uh, Missouri is dangerous. Mm -hmm. In the last seven games that they've lost, they've all been by single digits. They are right on the cusp. They run a motion offense that it needs time. If there had been a summer and a non-conference season and there weren't the COVID pauses, they'd be right in the hunt. Well, they're hitting their stride right now. So you got Alabama, they got their big three with Jordan Lewis, Jasmine Walker, Aria Copeland, Ari Copeland. Those three, when they're clicking, Alabama is dangerous. So the SEC, <laughs> let me tell you, when the SEC's on TV, you better get you some popcorn and settle in because you can't predict what's going to happen in that game. What, you got a dark horse for the tournament since you just went through those teams so well about, you know, what their deficiency might be or their question mark or their mystery. You know, do you like somebody? I know I always say when people ask me this, when we don't see the seating and all that, but I'm, I'm just curious, like, who has a team that checks a lot of the boxes for you? Um... Well, the obvious are South Carolina and Texas A&M. Mm -hmm. um, the spoiler, I think, could be like last year uh, that made it all the way to the semifinals is Arkansas. Because Chelsea Dungy might yeah. be the hardest player to defend in the SEC. She could shoot the three. She's got the meanest left to right or right to left crossover. And it used to be that she couldn't go right. Well. She can go right. So, and she can get to the free throw line. So she's worth the price of admission. Mm -hmm. I call that a ticket selling player. Oh, no question. Yeah. What other ticket selling players you got in the SEC right now? Like must oh, see, as you said. Big baby. Aaliyah Boston at South Carolina. Six, five, but don't pin me to the block. Because she can step out. She's got the free throw line 15-footer. She has even demonstrated she can shoot the three. She can also rebound and bring it. She's got decent handles. She's been working with assistant coach Jolette Law, and she will tell you, I used to have a bag of tricks that I could fit in my backpack. Now I got a duffel bag. So don't even sleep on Big Baby. She's getting uh, she's getting handling handles uh, ball handling skills from the former Harlem Globetrotter. Are you kidding me? Hey, there's nobody else better to get them from. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Carolyn. You you you've coached, you broadcast, you coach, you broadcast. You know, I, I know you love the game as much as I do because. People can always tell it in our voices when they hear us call a game. But what are you enjoying the most about calling games from home or, you know, the different pace that we're on right now? Oh, well, from being from home, I can, uh, without the travel, I can see more games. Because, you know, a lot of times if you don't download it from Synergy onto your computer, you're not watching them on the plane. You know, a lot of times I'm having to get up in the morning before you would go to the airport. You're downloading to make sure those games are saved to the computer so you can watch them on your on your laptop. Same so being at yeah, so being at home, I can watch a lot more uh, basketball and see uh, a lot of different systems and how coaches are adjusting to things, and so that makes it fun. But I tell you what, I miss. I miss the kids, you know, I mean, a zoom is one thing and you can do that interview, but watch them at shoot around and they come over sweaty and giddy and giggly after they've had a good practice and you get to talk to them about their game and you get to see them in person about having that excitement about their next game coming up or the last game that they've had in person. I miss that. 
Yeah, I miss the squeak, the smell, the snap of the net, all that stuff too. Talking to the coaches, being around, picking up that in, that game day adjustment from shoot around or something that you can look for in the game that you can share with the audience. That's what I, I like that too. Well, you um, know, the other thing I miss, Debbie, is our crew. Yeah. You know, after the game, we can get together and, and uh, assemble, maybe have a, a cold beverage. You're talking about post game, aren't you? I am talking about a little post game and rehash what happened in the game. And, you know, you may agree or disagree, but just to that camaraderie of, of talking about the game. I'm excited about the NCAA tournament being in one spot. You know, uh, all of the teams coming together. We don't know what it's going to look like yet or how it's going to work, but I'm excited about the S curve because we're finally going to get seated based on, you know, a true mathematical seating. One plays 64, two plays 63, et cetera. What is your take on the tournament? But how are you going to get set up in all your numbers? Is it going to be the net or is it going to be – an eye test. Listen, CP, I, I let's hope it's not the, the net. If it's the net, we're in trouble because I'm not sure what in the world is in that tool. It just doesn't seem like you know, I wish it up with the teams. Well, I wish I had the brain of uh, Charlie Cream to figure out what he's coming up with because I think the net applies to some teams and the eye test applies to others. And I think that that's going to be what happens with the – uh, with the committee, because all the teams are not playing the same number of games. And you look at teams that may have had some of the top ranked teams on their schedule, but because of COVID, they had the intention of playing them, but they didn't get to. So you give them credit for that because they had them on the schedule, but they didn't play. I don't know how that all is going to come into play. And then you take, let's take Arkansas, for example. Arkansas all of a sudden has Connecticut fall onto their schedule. And they weren't originally scheduled, but they beat them. So now they get the benefit of that where somebody who was supposed to play UConn, they had the intention of it, but that game got postponed or canceled. Yeah. So do they get penalized? If you don't play, even if it was scheduled, that shouldn't be a part of the net. Like you got to play games to get in the net. And and I don't I don't but know. But the women's net there. plays part of that historical the historical what you did in the past. And none of those players, some of them ain't even playing anymore. Yeah, so yeah. they they yeah. took a year extra because the men put the net tool in and then the women took a year to investigate and research and they have put their tool out and it's called the net and it's got some different metrics than the men have. I just don't know what all is in it. But I, I know the only piece of criteria that I'm aware of that they relaxed was you had to be 500. So if you're below 500, but you meet the minimum 13 games, you still could be considered for the NCAA tournament. We'll you know what I wish they had? Sue, Sue Donahoe, when she was running the NCAA, God rest her soul, I'd love to be some Sue. But she had that mock draft. Yeah. And I think now with the net, more than any, and we can do it via Zoom. Let's do that just so we can have an understanding of kind of what the process is that the committee's going through. Well, you know, I'm always right on the edge of getting myself in trouble with the committee and the NCAA because I'm a little bit outspoken at times about some of the things and practices and what they decide and what they don't decide. But uh, I think it's good conversation. That's why we have the podcast, so we can have the conversation, right? Where else can we really have it without – I know I can't have it on the air without getting in trouble, so. Well, yeah, and the podcast is a, a great place to have it. Can you get um, Lynn Holzman on your podcast, ask her a few questions? I've already had Lynn Holzman on my podcast and separately I've had Nina King on my podcast. So they agreed to do it and uh, I thought it was pretty good. You know, I thought it went pretty well. Yeah, I challenged oh, Lynn. Well, to, there you go. Here, here was my challenge. Now I know let's have this one last topic of conversation because I know that you personally love this topic. 
I think the women's game, and especially the games like last night where one and two, UConn and South Carolina, South Carolina, UConn, one and two playing each other. There should be a line on that game. And that line should be broadcast and shared across our platforms at ESPN and in conversation. Not that we're picking the game, but you know, gambling, fantasy sports, all that are big properties at ESPN. If there were lines on our women's game, because I know you like to roll the dice and play cards once in a while. And, you know, I don't know about you and Jim, but when Frank and I go to Vegas, he rolls the dice. I drink the drinks. We're perfectly fine. That's the way we do it. I'm happy with that arrangement. But um, the whole gambling part of it, I'm not advocating gambling. What I'm advocating is lines on the women's games because I think if people will see a line on the game, I think they'll be more interested in our game. They actually might put money on it. If they put money on it, they're going to pay attention. If they pay attention, they're going to watch. If they watch, ratings go up. And ultimately, it works out to be great for our game because it helps move our game forward gives us creative inventory to sell, and it gets people in that 18 to 48-year-old male demographic interested in our sport at a little bit of a higher level. And if you bring one person along, you might bring a couple. I think it's interesting. And that's what I challenge Lynn Holzman to take a look at. Well, Jim and I are opposite from you and your husband. I play cards, and he does the drinks. <laughs> so. I'm the benefactor, and I foot the bill. But, um, you know, I, 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 I see what you're saying, and I think that, number one, what it would do is it would cause our platforms to promote the game more when there is a, a dollar value investment in it. Because... This is the thing that is amazing to me, Debbie, is in the WNBA, when all other sports were shut down this past summer, it was the hottest sport you would have ever seen. Ratings were off the chart. When the other sports came around, it seemed like we forgot about women's basketball or that it was not quite uh, the hot ticket that it was over the summer. What changed? Fans still want to see women's basketball, but the inventory gets taken up and gobbled up by other sports and, and other interests. Now, who makes that decision? Because I got fans that are blowing up my Twitter going, why is this women's basketball game not on a network somewhere? So then if you put money on it, you know, then what? Would it bring the interest? Maybe. I think that there needs to be more interest, more, uh, let me tell you, we have about tapped out when it comes to the amount of money you're going to make on football and men's basketball. What's the next money maker for you to make money on? It's women's basketball. It is an untapped source. If there was somewhere that I could buy stock in it to where, because eventually some knucklehead or some brainiac is going to realize how to do it, and I'm going to buy low, and I'm going to be a millionaire later because that's where the money is going. It's there to be made. I 100% I agree with you. I, I will even take it a step further. You know, the corporate partner program was put in place for the final four for the men, and all the other NCAA championships are underneath it. We have never taken women's basketball and tried to creatively sell it. And as a partner with ESPN, now neither one of us can speak for ESPN, and I'm certainly not speaking for ESPN. I'm speaking on the same thing that I've been speaking about for 13 years, and that is trying to find a way to create a sizzle around our game. Changing the format, being in one location, that's one way. Finding some uh, a resource like we have a partnership at ESPN with William Hill. I mean, that's a sports book. I mean, like, why can't we get some lines on the women's games? They will do it in the NCAA tournament. We will get some lines in the tournament. But when the bigger games are being played, like South Carolina and UConn, like to me, that is a money line explosion for basketball fans. It's a great opportunity. And I think we ought to take a look at how we can. It's not like we don't have Budweiser in, in arenas. It's not like we're promoting drinking. Okay. It's not, it's a, it's another vice that people might consider as a bad habit in quotes, but 
you know, it's an opportunity. Fantasy sports is huge. I live with all men. I don't even know how many fantasy football teams they have. They have so many. But my guys know the odds, the spreads. They know the lines. They know that because I think it's a part of what some men do in sports culture. They just know what the lines are. And I think on the women's side, it would benefit our game greatly. I would be really interested to know what Vegas would have put on the line for South Carolina UConn last night. Aren't you sort of interested in what that might have been? I mean, like, I think that's really interesting. Oh, I think it'd be interesting because, and I don't know whether it's legal or not, but my family, because I have three brothers and my mom and dad, and we did a board for the Super Bowl. And it was a quarter a square, but it made me watch every quarter. <laughs> exactly. I so mean, the same thing. It's It's exactly what I'm talking about. I think when Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, decided that he was going to figure out a way to monetize fantasy sports in the NBA, that that's when everyone else started paying attention, including Mark Emmerich, the president of the NCAA. And so now that Vegas is open for championships, and I'm just saying that's one spot. I'm not saying that's the spot, but a destination city. And then it doesn't matter where it is. Sports gambling is going to be legal in every state pretty soon. So we can put it anywhere just for that one piece of metric. But the most important thing would be giving fans an opportunity on Selection Monday or even on Christmas morning, more so Christmas morning, to know that you could buy a plane ticket and a hotel ticket to this particular city and that 16 teams were going there. And if you could roll the dice on thinking your team was going great, but if you're a fan and you're willing to do that at Christmas time for your family, probably doesn't matter what teams go. You probably prefer your team goes, but how much fun would that be? It gives you a chance to plan in advance. And I think that's as much for the fan as it is for the athletes and the coaches deserving an S curve because the product has gotten so good. Well, I don't know what the fan uh, participation is going to be yet for San Antonio, but it would be a good test pilot for what's going to happen this year with it being in one place. I mean, you look at what the NCAA does with baseball and softball. You know where it's going to be. You're in and you're out. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree. Um, it's just a matter of of where and how to do it. Um, but. You know, even the men's regionals, they used to be set. Like, I always knew that Lexington, Kentucky was going to be a site. So teams, if you were a fan of basketball, you were going to buy a ticket to go to Lexington, Kentucky and get a seat in Rupp Arena. Right. Exactly. So if you just establish instead of moving around, I, I don't, I you know. I think it's going to happen before we our lifetime is over. I do believe it. It might take another lifetime to happen, but I do think it's going to happen. I hope I'm still around when it does. <laughs> I have nine lives, so I'll still be here. Carolyn, you're the best. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's so fun to talk hoops with you, break it down, and have a really important conversation at the beginning. So uh, I hope uh, that we can have you uh, back again and uh, we can do a postseason show when we get ready for the tournament. Absolutely. Will it be cocktails next time? Definitely cocktails, 100%. <laughs> we'll do it. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you.